who was the person who most inspired you to play this music? And what was it about that person that motivated you? I'll take anybody that'll speak. <laughs> Gene Krupa was five years old, and uh, he was on the, uh, it gets better. Uh, he was on the Bird Griffin Variety Show, black and white television, and uh, I remember just lying on the floor looking up at our black and white television, and, there weren't any other kinds. Um, and he had a, maybe that's why he wore a black suit and a white shirt. Um, and uh, he had a thin tie and crisp shirt and his hair was slicked back and he did sing, sing, sing all by himself. And the hair standing up on the back of my neck as I'm telling you this. Can you, can you see that? Okay. And so, uh, so I had to do that. Well, unfortunately, um, my, everybody in my family was a piano player, so I had to do that. So I started piano at 5 and quit at 5.30. <laughs> Eventually, at eight, at 8 years old, I, I got to play the drums and study privately, but he was the main inspiration for uh, me wanting to play drums, and it was the whole persona. I mean, he was handsome, he had the slick back hair, which I've been trying for 50 years. <laughs> it's not going to work. And, um, and, and, you know, he was one of the first, as you know, he's one of the first, the first, a drum soloist to bring the drum solo to the, the mass public. And uh, we have him to thank for that. But in some some nights, I'm thinking maybe we have him to blame for that, <laughs> and how good the drummer is. So, but uh, Gene Krupa definitely was my first uh, inspiration. And what was it about it? Is that Diana Krall calling? <laughs> and, and, you know, what, what was it about his playing or his his performance that that motivated you? Uh, the look, first of all, and the fact that I've never seen anyone do that before. You know, the floor tom solo, boom, 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 boom. boom. Fantastic. That, and then the, later on, I realized the hair still stand on the back of my neck. I realized later when I was really trying to get a big sound out of the drums, and I played Caskin Heads for 20 years, which Gene did on Slug on the Radio Kings. And that sound that he had was such a huge sound that I, I realized that's what got to me the sound of the instrument, not so much what he was playing, but the big sound that he got out of the drums. Because my next hero is Buddy Rich. And Buddy had a smaller sound. It was a it was a louder sound, but he had a more precise staccato sound than Gene did. Gene had this big rub a dub, rub a dub sound, and that's really what attracted me. Any other questions? For me, it was a junior high choir director. Because I grew up with country music, it was, you know, I thought I was going to be Barbara Mandrell. And the cool group to be in at school was the vocal jazz ensemble. And when I saw them in sixth grade, I wanted to be in the band. I wasn't looking to be in the choir. I was looking to be playing guitar in the band. This is not a guitar, it's a bass guitar. I was like, whatever. I want to be in the band. So, um, you know, and then listening, and he had music on the piano, and I heard Ella for the first time in that choir room, I heard Sarah Vaughn, I heard Manhattan Transfer, I heard Frank Sinatra, I heard Diane Reeves, and then through all that, um, you know, just really inspired me, and then playing and singing, he's like, well, you can't do that. So like, why not? No, it was not even that much. It was just, well, you're the bass player, if you take a vocal solo, who's going to play bass? And it was like, well, I will. Oh, no, you won't. I said, well, why not? Well, you'll sing out of tune, and then if you sing right, then you're going to play out of time, and it's just, it's going to be a mess, and you're going to train my entire choir. I was like, where do I practice? <laughs> you? <laughs> and that, so, he really just kind of lit that fire under me of just that, of throwing things my way, and challenging, and you know, daring me to succeed. So. Well, I didn't want to answer this question because uh, uh, I guess the first person that really influenced me was Chuck Maggio. And then um, after that, uh, my father went to school in Cannabis and he always pushed me to play jazz, play jazz. But all the other students around me all played classical music and we were living in Chicago at the time. So my idol growing up after Chuck Maggio was a trumpet player by the name of Bud Herseth. And Bud Herseth was the principal of the Chicago Symphony. And 
uh, by hearing from hearing Bud Herson, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to play classical music. And my father said, jazz, jazz, jazz. I said, no jazz. So uh, that was my aspiration. I wanted to play in an orchestra. And I wanted to be the first African American in an orchestra. And I studied under, through my undergrad just to play in an orchestra. And I started to play some shows. And then it wasn't until grad school, almost finished, when I was finished with grad school with my degree in classical trumpet, that I decided that I wanted to try jazz. And at that point, um, no one was really willing to teach me. They were all they all said the same thing. It's you're too old to try jazz now. I'll just stick with the classical. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, just you know, you don't know anything about the vocabulary. You don't know anything about swing. You don't know anything about that. And my classical friends were saying, just just play the trumpet and just keep doing what you're doing. And my jazz friends were like, don't play jazz. Don't play jazz. Play that. So I um, um, had a great. I was fortunate to have a great professor at Rutgers University when I was getting my degree. His name was Kenny Barron. And I would go to Kenny. And, uh, Kenny was really, really special. And he would give me assignments to work on. He goes, you're not too old. You can learn how to do this. And I was about 22, 23 when I started. So I would say, personally, it really influenced me was Kenny Barron because he was just so patient and so willing to show me things that no one else wanted to show me. And, and he was one of the first people, besides Bobby Watson, that gave me the opportunity to play the um, the first person that inspired me was my dad, who was a jazz guitar. He was a chemist by trade, but a jazz guitarist. Um, at nighttime, but when the uh, you know, they had regional bands at that time, so when he was in one of the regional bands that went from Ohio, where we lived through Pittsburgh and uh, that general area, those you know, two or three states only. But he um, he had that old Freddie Green style of comping, that chunk, 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 chunk. So, you know, I, I got to play with somebody with great time early on, and I learned by ear. Didn't know what a chord was, didn't know anything. But I learned by ear, and that helped me be a better player so much, I couldn't believe it. But the thing that made me think that I could do this, um, well, there's an interim step there. I brought, when I, when I was babysitting at 13, I brought home a Ray Brown, Ed Thingpen, and Oscar Peterson record that I bought with my own babysitting money. And it was called We Get Requests. And I wore that one out and my parents bought me another LP. And I started playing along with Oscar's right hand, which was, you know, I got about half the notes. <laughs> but um, with that rhythm section behind me, I felt like I could do anything. And of course, if you, you know, if you can't play with that rhythm section, you can't play. So he, uh, so all three of them inspired me to have that, that experience with that going on on an LP behind me playing. And then when I got to tell my dad, just before he passed, that I was going on tour with Ray, uh, that was the ultimate, you know, you go, you start out, you go, and then you get, you get to play with your idol for the first time. So um, I'm gonna go on to a new question. I was a little, kid with, well, I still have little hands. It was the only thing I could hold. So my sister brought it home from school thinking that I could hold it. And that and I could hold it. Okay, so, second question. Um, which group situation stands out in your memory as the gig with the most perfect chemistry? That either an organized group or a jazz party set or a jam session, but when you had the experience of a lifetime with a group where everything was just killing and you had the best time. You want to go down there? Well, there's so many of those things. <laughs> Actually, last night uh, you folks saw the two groups that are my answer to that question because in 1976, Bonnie Alexander, John Clayton, and I played in. Montreux, Switzerland, the Montreux uh, Jazz Festival, and I was uh, 22, I think, at the time. 21, it was just before my birthday, and, and uh, Clayton 
course, is a year older than me. And we uh, we were at the uh, festival playing, and we followed our followed my hero, Mel Lewis, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band. And they were having an off night because they just got in in time to play the gig. And I sat behind this scrim to, to watch Mel play, and I was so inspired as we came out. And um, my new best friend has arrived. I hear. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the panel, and we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs> so I was uh, I was ready to go rip it up as soon as we hit the bandstand, and uh, we were kind of the forgotten throwaway break group because nobody knew Monty or John or me at that time, and they came to see Thad Jones Belmonte, and then following us was Stan Getz Quartet with Joanne Brackeen, wow. Billy Hart, and Cliff Houston, Clint Houston, and. And they would they they got up to go get their drinks and Monty lit into the introduction of Night Miss Blues. And you can see everybody just kind of stop and turn toward the stage and sit back down in their chairs. And before you knew it, they were standing up clapping on every beat of everything they were playing. Not like last night. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I felt like uh, I was I was doing the playing, but I didn't. I had no control over what I was doing. It was just, it was an out of body experience. As you're a kid, and you're at one of the greatest jazz festivals in the world, and the music's just happening, but you're not really controlling it. It's just happening, and to feel the energy from the audience was unbelievable. Uh, I still don't remember that much about being on the stage, just because of the adrenaline and being so excited. And little did we know that Montreux recorded every session and then sold it to the record companies later, and that's how that became a record. And we hated the sound of the record. It was, a, you know, they, John, that's the last time John Clayton ever used an amplifier because he heard the sound that they ruined of his bass, and he went to a microphone in front of the bass after that. My sound sounded like a, a funk drum set, but the music was exciting, and, and so we have that documented that evening. The second experience is more of a long-term experience, and that's the other trio that you heard last night. Uh, the group that I had for 10 years really has, uh, we feel the same way about music. We think alike. We've got each other's back all the time. If somebody drops the ball, somebody's there to pick it up, which is what this is about when you play the music. You play to make everybody else sound as good as they can. That's what we do. So it's more of a long-term experience of, of being one of the greatest experiences of my life. There are other nights, like the first night I joined Oscar Peterson, and that was a memorable night, um, where he turned around and gave me four choruses on the first tune of soloing, and I thought, he's trying to get me to hang myself here. <laughs> I know what's going on here, I'm gonna pace myself. So I played the first chorus, and I looked over at him, he pointed to me for a second chorus, and pointed to the third chorus, and pour a little more heat on it. The fourth chorus, and a little more, and then he took it out, and at the end of the, Two, and he stood up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to my new drummer, Jeff Hamilton. <laughs> and I, I took a bow, and as I bent over like this, he says off microphone, so you're going to be like that, huh? <laughs> so that's, that's reaching your goal of wanting to play with someone like that since you're 10 years old, and then the first night you get to do it, that's, that's pretty